markets are now flooded with cheaper Chinese electric cars. And their price is kept artificially low by huge state subsidies. This is distorting our market. And as we do not accept this distortion from the inside in our market, we do not accept this from the outside. Climate change, we need it. But we also should not underestimate the real threats coming from AI, mostly Gen AI. This is my video update from Larnica, Cyprus. On this Thursday afternoon, September the 14th, let's talk about some news. And let's start things off with Ursula van der Pirate. <laughs> Ursula van der Pirate. Schultz, the pirate, Pirate Schultz, Ursula van der Leyen, she gave her State of the European Union address yesterday. And she made a couple of interesting comments. Most of her speech was about the, uh, the, green, the green Deal and the environment and uh, climate change and stuff like that. But, uh, but, but she did mention some uh, some inter interesting things during her State of the European Union. For example, she talked about Chinese electric vehicles, and she pretty much declared war on uh, China's car industry. She uh, she claims she's accusing China. Actually, she's accusing China of subsidizing their car industry and uh, making the electric vehicles very inexpensive for the European Union consumer and dumping those vehicles in the EU. And she said that that's unacceptable. It is unacceptable, she said. And, uh, and she said that uh, she's going to start taking action against Chinese electric vehicle manufacturers because it's not good for European Union citizens to buy good, cheap, good affordable let's say good affordable chinese vehicles it's, it's absolutely good for european union, union citizens to buy expensive eu electric vehicles <laughs> so that's uh that's pretty much what uh, what ursula van der van der Leyen said she declared war on china's auto industry it's not going to end well for the european union it is not going to end well at all the EU going up against China in manufacturing. It's not going to end well. <laughs> anyway, so uh, that, was, that was probably the most interesting part of uh, Ursula's State of the Union. She's going to bring the Chinese economy to tatters. To tatters is what she's going to do. China's auto industry will be in tatters. And uh, then she talked about EU enlargement. She, uh, she told all of the EU member states, all of the EU citizenry, to prepare, to prepare themselves for EU enlargement. And by enlargement, she is talking about Moldova, but really about Ukraine. And when she means prepare, she wants all of the EU member states and all of the EU citizens to prepare for enlargement. She basically means that everyone needs to prepare themselves to get a lot poorer because, according to Ursula, the European Union, they, uh, they have to. They have to uh, bring in these new countries. It's part of uh, the EU's uh, obligation. It's the EU's obligation, she said, to not leave any of, uh, of their European citizens behind. So they have to bring them in. They're obliged to bring in Ukraine and Moldova and a bunch of other countries into the European Union. And she just wants to let all of the citizens of the EU know that they should prepare themselves. She used the word prepare. They should prepare themselves is what Ursula is telling everyone in, uh, in Europe. The Guardian says the EU needs to prepare for enlargement now. Van der Leyen warns member states will have to make radical changes 
for Ukraine and others to join the bloc. Radical changes, according to the Guardian and according to Ursula. That means that the everyday EU citizens are going to get a lot poorer. The, the EU kleptocracy, they're going to get a lot richer. <laughs> but the everyday citizen, she's warning, she's warning everybody that they need to prepare themselves. It's going to be a very, very difficult decade because Ukraine must enter the European Union. So that, uh, that was Ursula's State of the European Union address. Let's now talk about a directive that Ursula and the European Commission came up with the other day, and that is the confiscation of Russian automobiles and, uh, and Russian personal belongings entering the European Union the personal belongings and automobiles of Russian travelers and tourists who enter the European Union. I've talked about this directive over my past uh, couple of videos, but we now have the first EU member states enforcing this directive. And take a wild guess which countries are the first countries to enforce this EU confiscation theft directive, because that's really what it is. The first countries to enforce this are, of course, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Who else would it be but the Baltic nations? According to the Estonian foreign minister, this is what he, he put out on the social platform X, formerly known as Twitter. He said, starting today, Estonia will deny entry to all Russian registered vehicles. They are not welcome here to enjoy the privileges freedom has to offer until Ukraine has achieved victory. So because Ukraine will never achieve victory, it looks like the Russians will never be allowed to travel to the European Union. Well, at least they, uh, they can't travel to, to the European Union and expect their personal belongings to remain their personal belongings. Because what is happening now is that if you're Russian, and you decide to take a trip to the EU as a tourist, these, uh, the EU member states, according to this commission directive, they have to take your, uh, your automobile. If you drive in into the EU or if you fly in, they have to confiscate any items that you bring with you, which are on the sanctions list. Mobile phones, toiletries, shampoo, toilet paper, Anything that's on the sanctions list, according to the European Commission, EU member states have to steal, confiscate, <laughs> confiscate, steal. You pick the word. But uh, that's, that's the directive. And it looks like we have our first three EU member states now enforcing this, uh, this directive from Ursula von der Crazy and uh, Dmitry Medvedev. He, uh, he commented on this directive and he said that... Uh, it looks like Russia is going to have to cut off diplomatic relations with the European Union. And uh, I think this is probably a proper, a proper move for Russia. I think it's the, the appropriate response, given how absolutely crazy this, uh, this directive is from the European Union. Collective punishment of uh, personal... Uh, the personal belongings of Russian citizens, collective punishment. We've, uh, we've been here before, I think. Anyway, that is, uh, that's an update there with this confiscation of Russian belongings as they enter the European Union and preventing Russian automobiles from driving into the EU. I love the, I love the word that the foreign minister uses. Russians cannot enjoy the freedom of Europe, the privileges that freedom has to offer in the European Union. <laughs> Keep in mind that Estonia is doing this while uh, Kaya Kalas, his husband, is, is enjoying the freedom of doing business with Russia. <laughs> He's making all kinds of money doing business with Russia. So uh, just keep that in mind. An interesting choice of words there from the foreign minister. That's, that's interesting. It's an interesting type of freedom 
that the European Union has, isn't it? Very interesting type of freedom. Anyway, let's, uh, let's talk about the multipolar world and how we're actually heading into, I would say we're heading into a bipolar world because the EU, they have now put up, they have effectively put up an Iron Curtain. The Iron Curtain is, is now back in place from, from a time long ago when there was a Cold War. The EU has just erected a new Iron Curtain. And uh, Anthony Blinken, the U.S. Secretary of State, he was giving a speech at John Hopkins University. And he admitted that the world is split. In his speech, he said that we are indeed in a multipolar world. I don't think he used the word multipolar, but he did say that the world is split. You have the, the international, the U.S.-led international order, which is what Blinken called it. And then you have the, the rest of the world, <laughs> the, the garden and the jungle. And uh, Blinken, well, it's an acknowledgement from Blinken that it's not a unipolar world anymore. It's a multipolar world. That's, that's actually a huge statement from the U.S. Secretary of State admitting that we are indeed in a multipolar world. Blinken said that the number one adversary is China, but the leaders of this multipolar world, it's the, it's the BRICS nations, it's China and Russia, and you have India and South Africa and Brazil and all the nations of BRICS, but China, China is the big adversary. But he did say that uh, in this conflict between the international rules-based order the rules-based order, that's what he called it, the rules-based order, right? In this conflict between the international rules-based order and the, uh, the rest of the world, the jungle, this conflict between garden and jungle, the, uh, the first challenge to the garden is the conflict in Ukraine. Blinken didn't use the word garden and jungle. I'm using the words garden and jungle. Blinken used the China-led uh, led order, and the international rules-based order. That's what we call the U.S. Collective West, the international rules-based order. Those are the good guys for Blinken. The other guys are the bad guys. The garden is good, the jungle is bad, according to Blinken, and the first battle in this, this new system is taking place in Ukraine. As long as it takes, the international rules-based order cannot allow the jungle to win in Ukraine. They cannot not allow the jungle to win the first major battle. So uh, speaking about the, uh, the battle that is taking place in Ukraine, let's, uh, let's discuss a bit the, uh, the strike that took place the other day in uh, Sevastopol. I said in my video yesterday that, uh, that there were some, some theories that the missiles used to hit these, uh, these two ships, which were docked in uh, Sevastopol, they were undergoing repairs. One of the, actually one of the vessels is said to be a submarine and they were undergoing repairs. Now we still don't really have a clear indication as to the, the extent of the damage on these two ships. But anyway, the missiles that were used to hit these ships, some people were speculating that attackums were used. This was the debut of the attackums missiles. But, Sky News, they came out with an article and uh, Sky News claims that according to their sources in Ukraine and uh, British Intel, that the missiles that were used were Storm Shadow missiles. This is according to an article from Sky News. Storm Shadow, British Storm Shadows. And of course the UK is not a party to this conflict. You always got to keep that in mind, even though Sky News was, uh, was pretty happy about the fact that Storm Shadows were used to uh, attack Crimea. And then Forbes came out with an article a few hours later with the title, Ukrainian bombers firing Western cruise missiles have knocked out a Russian submarine. So Forbes, they came out with an article citing their sources in the Ukraine military, which claim that uh, a Russian submarine was completely destroyed. And then at the bottom of this article, Forbes actually puts out a threat to Russia. The final paragraph of this article, 
is a threat, and it reads like this. And the losses almost, almost certainly will continue. The Ukrainians have proved they can strike Russian warships in ports in both Crimea and Russia proper. No port is safe for what remains of the Black Sea Fleet. So that's Forbes pretty much threatening the Russian military. The Collective West via Forbes, the Ukraine military via Forbes telling the Russian military and the Russian Black Sea Fleet that nothing, nothing, no one, not one ship, not one vessel, not one sub is safe. Forbes in their article, they claim that uh, the Ukraine military has cracked the code into uh, striking at, uh, at Russia, at Crimea, at will. Whenever they want, they can now hit Crimea and hit Russia. They've, they've figured it out with these uh, Storm Shadow missiles. So that was the article via Forbes. And then we have two articles that I spotted, though there are many more posts about this next uh, story. And keep in mind, before I get to the next story, always keep in mind the UK is not a party to this conflict. Always keep that in mind. You always have to remember that as, as, Forbes, uh, as Forbes throws out this threat to uh, Russia proper and Crimea. You always got to remember that the UK, they're, they're not a party to this conflict or they're not a party to, to this war at all. We're just helping Ukraine defend themselves. And, and you know, my thinking on this is that uh, the NATO exercises, which I believe are, are starting up tomorrow, but they've been preparing for these exercises over the past couple of days. The, uh, what, what's it called? The ocean breeze or the sea breeze or something like that. Ocean breeze is like a, it's a fruit, a fruit uh, drink, isn't it? <laughs> I think ocean breeze anyway, or maybe it's a cologne. Um, <laughs> this, this exercise that is taking place, or that's about to take place tomorrow, between Romania, um, the United States, Ukraine said they're participating, Turkey said they're participating, uh, I believe the UK is participating. Uh, this exercise, I imagine, was, uh, that's going to be taking place with, uh, with NATO right along the, uh, the coast of Romania in the Black Sea. I imagine that this was used as cover so that the planes, the fighter jets, could launch the Storm Shadows because the platform that has to be used to launch uh, Storm Shadows has to be a fighter jet. It's, uh, it's air to, to surface. So I imagine that this NATO exercise provided the cover that was needed so that uh, the fighter jets, which according to Forbes were Ukrainian bombers, but who knows, uh, this was the cover that was needed in order to launch this, uh, this attack. Keep in mind, you also had the announcements a couple of days ago from Rishi Sunak, where he said that the, uh, the Royal Air Force was going to be patrolling this area in the Black Sea as well in order to safeguard this new grain uh, corridor that they've created close to, uh, to the coast of Romania. So I think that uh, the UK and NATO, they provided a lot of uh, different, different excuses to, to get this fighter jet up and, uh, and launching the storm shadows towards, uh, towards Crimea. So Russia knows what happened. I don't think we have a, an official statement, by the way, from the Russian Ministry of Defense as to what the missiles were. We're, we're going off of what Sky News has reported, but Russia knows. The Russian uh, Ministry of Defense knows, and um, we'll see. We'll see if there is a retaliation for this. 24 people injured. I believe two people did die that were actually working in, uh, in the port. Workers, just civilian um, uh, workers that were working on uh, repairing these, uh, these vessels. Um, we'll see. We'll see what Russia does. Remember what Shoigu said three months ago or two months ago that if Western missiles are used to attack the Russian Federation, then Russia will destroy decision-making centers of the uh, collective West of NATO. We'll see if that, uh, if that threat, if that warning uh, holds. We will find out, or if it's just another red line that the Collective West crosses and, uh, and Russia does not respond. We'll find out in the next 
the next couple of, uh, of days or a couple of weeks. So uh, let's get back to the next story that I was about to talk about before I, I went back to the Storm Shadow Crimea story. And that is the, I was going to talk about the articles that have come out, the many articles that have come out talking about how Russia is, wait for it, wait for it, how Russia is not running out of weapons. Russia's not running out of weapons. According to the New York Times, uh, Russia overcomes sanctions to expand Missile production, officials say. Moscow's missile production now exceeds pre-war levels, officials say, leaving Ukraine especially vulnerable this coming winter. And then Business Insider put out an article with the title, Russian manufacturers are making up to seven times as much ammunition as Western arms makers, Estonian defense official says. So, wait a minute. Wasn't it just yesterday that... Uh, the collective West media was telling us that Putin is begging North Korea for uh, ammunition and for weapons. Didn't uh, Mark Milley say that Putin is going to North Korea, and I quote, with a tin cup in hand to beg for weapons? That was yesterday. And now the New York Times and Business Insider, but the New York Times, the paper of record, they're telling us that Russia is, uh, is beating sanctions and... Their weapons uh, industry, their, their weapons manufacturing is booming. What's going on here? I thought Russia was running out of weapons. Now they're not running out of weapons? So the new narrative is Russia is not running out of weapons. I, I, never, I never thought I would live to see the day. I'm looking for, I'm looking for the, uh, the pigs that are flying. <laughs> I'm looking for the pigs that are flying. <laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> when pigs fly, I can't believe it. Russia's not running out of weapons. I never, ever thought I would live the day to, uh, to read a New York Times article that says Russia's not running out of weapons. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Something strange in the universe is going on. <laughs> Something really, really weird is happening. I don't know. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Unbelievable. All right. I think that... Uh, let me see. If I have any other stories to, uh, to get to. Let's do one more story, a quick story, and we'll get to to a clown world. The uh, Czech Republic, they, uh, they came out with a statement today, I believe, today or yesterday, and they said that uh, they've received requests from the Alensky regime to extradite military-aged men who are living in the Czech Republic to send them back to Ukraine so they can be sent to the front lines, and the Czech Republic said no. They refused this request. And I'm getting reports that more EU countries have received this request to extradite, and uh, these EU countries are going to refuse this, uh, this request. So there you have it. Walensky's going to be in a bit of a bind if he can't uh, extradite all of the, the Ukrainian men living abroad to send them to the front lines, which shows how bad the losses are for Ukraine if Alensky is having to send requests to the Czech Republic and other EU member states to ask them to extradite, to extradite military-aged men. And there are also reports which claim that, uh, that the Alensky regime is also uh, putting notices at universities to, uh, to take men out of, uh, of university and send them to the front line. So things look really really bad for the Ukraine military. The losses are, uh, you can't hide the losses. You can't hide the losses and, and it's, uh, they are having an effect on, uh, on Ukraine's ability to continue to, to wage this, uh, 
this counteroffensive, if you can even call it that, this counteroffensive that they're undertaking. It looks like uh, they're running out of manpower. So that was an interesting story. Let's do a couple of clown worlds and we will wrap this video up because I've uh, in 10 minutes, I've got a live stream with Alexander, Brian Berletic, and Patrick Lancaster. So let's do two quick clown worlds and I'll get to the live stream on the Duran channel. So the first clown world is an update from yesterday's clown world where Alensky's BFF Podoliak, he said that uh, China and India have a low, a low IQ population. Turkey as well, he said, actually Turkey as well. He said they, uh, they just can't make the right decisions because they're low IQ. And well, he got blasted for this. Um, I don't know if there was an official statement from the Indian government, for the government of India, but uh, I know that the social networks um, in, uh, in India and the comments that were being, uh, that were being posted on social media from, uh, from accounts in India were furious. They were actually making fun of Podoliak. They were making fun of him. They were saying, while, uh, what did, what did the, I think the best one was, uh, from an account on Twitter was from someone in India was, uh, we, we landed on the, on the moon and, uh, and you guys are, are stuck in minefields. That was, that was, I think one of the most popular, um, posts with regards to Podoliak's statement from India and China, they, uh, they came out with an official statement asking for clarification. So the Chinese government actually did come out with an official request for clarification as to what Podoliak meant. Because when Podoliak speaks, he is representing the, uh, the Alensky government, the Alensky regime. So China's like, is this the, uh, is this the official uh, position of the government of Ukraine? Is this how you view us as low IQ? And uh, Podoliak, he had to kind of walk back what he said during this interview. First off, he said that what he, what he said on TV, what we, what we have on TV, on video, we have his words, we have his appearance on video, but everything that we saw and everything that we heard from Podoliak in this interview was taken out of context. And it was manipulated by, of course, Russia. <laughs> so he's saying that Russia took out of context and manipulated his statement. So he's blaming it on Russia. And then he tried to explain what he said. And let me read you his explanation. On Wednesday, attempting to explain what he actually meant, Podoliak argued that Turkey, India, China, and other regional powers are increasingly and clearly justified in claiming global rules in the modern world. However, he said, the global world is much broader than even the most thoughtful regional national interests. The global world is based on stability and predictability, on rationality and strategy and, strategy and international law and, cre and clear rules of the game, which he insists Russia is trying to undermine. One way or another, it is irrational to ignore this due to situational and regional economic interests as it, as it has long term consequences, the sooner Russia loses, the more chances the world has to return to stability and rules of the game. The task of the great powers is to accelerate this moment. He had, in other words, he's not saying, I'm sorry. He's not saying I messed up. He's not saying, uh, I said something stupid. Nope. He's saying, uh, Russia has to lose, blame it on Russia and Russia has to lose. It's not even, it's not even a walk back. It's not an apology. It's not a walk back. It's not even a clarification, to be quite honest. It's basically, um, you know, India, China, Turkey, uh, you guys are, uh, you guys have the right to look after your national interests, but you have to, you have to join us in defeating Russia. That's pretty much what he is saying here. So uh, give me money. Give me money. I buy many homes. Um, <laughs> this, is, this, this was no apology. This was nothing. This was nothing.
not an apology. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a mea culpa, nothing like that. It's Russia is to blame and you guys, China, India, and Turkey, you need to turn your back on Russia. The moment you turn your back on Russia, you can be friends with us. <laughs> That's pretty much what Podoliak said. <laughs> and finally, let's do a clown world with uh, Sean Penn. Sean Penn, and he uh, sat down for an interview, I believe, with the New York Post. And he's promoting his documentary film called Superpower, which chronicles the life and times of one clown puppet actor leader of Ukraine, which is Alensky. And that is what this documentary film is about. It is about Alensky and uh, the year and a half of the special military operation. It is propaganda. This documentary is a propaganda piece in their article has the title Sean Penn says Will Smith slap made him want to melt his Oscars down to bullets to shoot at the Russians. And so this article pretty much talks about Sean Penn's feelings towards Will Smith. That's pretty much three fourths of this, uh, of this article and this interview. But in the middle of this New York uh, Post article, Sean Penn talks about melting his Oscar so that he can create bullets to shoot at Russians. And you know, I, I read this part where he talks about melting his Oscar. And to be quite honest, I think Sean Penn is high because he really is making no sense. So let me read you what the New York Post has here with regards to melting down his Oscar. Penn, who was promoting his new Paramount documentary Superpower about Ukraine's underdog fight to maintain its freedom from Russia, couldn't help but compare the Smith slap with the power struggle happening overseas. This effing bullshit wouldn't have happened with Zelensky, Penn said of Ukraine's sixth president. Will Smith would never have left the chair to be part of stupid violence. It never would have happened. I thought, well, F, you know, I'll give them to Ukraine. They can be melted down to bullets. They can shoot at the Russians. <laughs> I don't, you know, I, I guess he's explaining the Will Smith slap to Alensky. And if Alensky, I don't know, if, is he saying that if Alensky was Kid Rock, Kid Rock, if Alensky was Chris Rock, uh, he wouldn't have taken the slap from Will Smith? I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure. What are you trying to say, Sean Penn? I really have no idea what he is trying to say here and what this has to do with Will Smith slapping Chris Rock. I think, I think Sean Penn is, uh, I think he's doing that stuff that, that Alensky likes to do <laughs> in his free time. Anyway, that's the video, everybody, the Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and X. And go to the Duran shop. Use the code Good. They get 10% off. And uh, every now and then I say this during a video, so I will say this now. Like this video if you want. Subscribe to this channel if, uh, if you want. That would be really cool. Time to go, uh, time to go up here on a live stream. Take care.